Uh, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Lee Gehring, and I am the uh, I am one of the managing uh, partners of the investment firm Gehring and Rosenzweig Associates. One of the, the interesting things about our firm is that we spend a lot of time doing very, very in-depth research. What most people do is that they, they spend most of their time just extrapolating trends from the past. But we, what we try to do at Gehring and Rosenzweig is that we actually try to, to look into the future uh, at trends that often uh, have not even begun to develop yet. A lot of the, the directions and a lot of the solutions that are being put forth are, are, are I, I hate to say this, but almost incorrect in the sense that they are not going to wind up solving the, the problem that we have at hand today, and that's the idea of the CO2 problem. So the, the solutions that they provide are going to be difficult, if not impossible, to attain or accomplish. One of the things I, I would like to first discuss is some of the underlying assumptions that are contained in both the, the IEA, the International Energy Agency report, and the BP report, and why I, I believe, and why both Adam and I believe, that those reports are, are seriously flawed, and that the, the, the results that they try to put forth will, will never be attained. The report made headlines because it made reference to a sustainable development scenario, and under that scenario, global CO2 emissions could be cut in half by 2040. BP issued a report of their own, and in their report, they actually are even more bold. They have demand numbers going out to 2050, and they expect that we can get to net zero emissions over that time period. While both reports made a huge amount of press when they were released, we quickly realized that very few energy analysts had actually read what the report said and what in particular were the drivers to help bring CO2 emissions down. So we decided to do that. And what we found was very surprising. While wind and solar and EVs certainly got a lot of the attention, actually a really important driver of lower CO2 emissions was simply lower estimated per capita energy demand. In the case of the IEA report, they believe that on a global basis, we see per capita energy use go down by 25% between now and 2040. BP was a little bit less dramatic, but even they saw total per capita energy demand on a global basis going down about 17%. Now, we just don't think that that's possible. We've spent a lot of time studying demand trends in various energy markets over the last 25 years. And we've identified several important uh, indicators and models that suggest to us that, in fact, per capita demand is going to grow over the next 10, 20, and 30 years and not fall, and certainly not fall on a global basis by 20%. Both reports are go under the assumption that over the next uh, 20 years that we will see very large reductions in total energy uses. Uh, not only in the developed world, but in the um, emerging market world as well. The reason why this is going to be so difficult to attain is because of the, the variety of things that are happening today in the emerging market world. When the countries are poor, you're obviously your commodity consumption is very, very low. Things like energy, um, natural gas, uh, various metals, steel, and uh, you know agriculture. These are the, the primary. These are the primary commodities that would be affected by this this phenomenon, which we call the S curve. When when the your per capita GDP is very very low, and that is you know before you hit the a tipping point of about two thousand five hundred dollars of real per capita GDP. Uh, like I said, your commodity consumption is very low. It increases very little. However, when when the economy starts to grow, when you pass that two thousand five hundred a dollar per capita uh, tipping point in GDP, all of a sudden the, the commodity consumption begins to rise rapidly. And that, as you progress from 2,500 all the way up to almost $20,000 per capita GDP, that's when commodity consumption reaches its, its greater greatest uh, periods of year, uh, year over year increases. Obviously, the most famous example or the, the, the most interesting example of this phenomenon that's happened uh, starting all the way back in the early 2000s is what happened with China. Now, if you actually go through the numbers, the IEA is assuming that the developed world, the OECD world, will see their energy demand fall by 25%, which would take 
per person demand back to levels not seen since the late 1950s. So I think it's fair to say that that's probably too aggressive. However, where the model really falls short is when you look at emerging markets. Non-OECD countries are expected to see their per capita demand fall by 15%. And simply put, that can't happen. Most of these countries are in periods of very robust demand growth. And we don't see that changing. Even if efficiencies are introduced in the emerging market countries, the pie is just getting bigger. And so to say that emerging market per capita oil demand is going to fall by 15% is setting yourself up, I think, for a big disappointment. When the economy starts to grow, when you pass that $2,500, a dollar per capita uh, tipping point in GDP, all of a sudden the, the commodity consumption begins to rise rapidly. Obviously the most famous example or the, the, the most interesting example of this phenomenon that's happened uh, starting all the way back in the early 2000s is what happened with China. And of course, China's commodity consumption has grown incredibly uh, strongly over that time period. Why? Because they are in the center of that $2,500 to $20,000 per capita GDP level. Once you reach about $20,000 of real per capita GDP, your commodity intensity begins to level off and then will actually begin to be decline in many commodities. But we are nowhere near that, uh, that upper end tipping point. So why does the S-curve happen? Well, it's really, as far as we can see, it's three changes that happen, uh, and then a fourth that sort of layers on top of all of them. The first is a change in people's transportation preferences, which is to say, in emerging market economies, the population goes from riding bicycles to scooters and eventually to cars. The next thing that people do is they change their climate preference, which is to say they like to live in air conditioning. This is particularly true in subtropical regions, uh, notably India, but other places as well, parts of Indonesia uh, and other places that lay along the tropics. The third thing is dietary preferences change. And in particular, what I'm talking about is countries and populations choose to eat more meat. And by doing that, um, all of a sudden your energy required to raise that meat is substantially more than if you exist, subsisted uh, on exclusively a vegetarian diet. But there's another factor, uh, and that's urbanization. And as a population goes from rural to urban, their energy demand begins to move up exponentially. Given that backdrop that so many people are now in that period of high energy consumption, that for to assume that we're going to be able to reduce energy consumption on a global basis where the underlying trend is for an incredible increase in energy consumption is something that we believe just will not be able to happen. And so that will be one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest reasons why the various solutions put forth just have no uh, ability to accomplish what they're trying to, to do. The IEA and BP proposals are both bound to fail. If you just focus in on the IEA, they estimate that global carbon emissions can fall by 50% over the next 20 years. Now, how is that driven? That's 20% energy reduction per capita, 50 to 60% reduction in carbon intensity per unit of energy, and population growth makes up the rest. Now, instead of falling by 20%, we think that per capita energy demand on a global basis might actually rise by 10% for all the S-curve reasons we just talked about. Well, if that's the case, then you need your carbon intensity to fall between 70 and 90% in order to make the numbers balance and get this 50% reduction in carbon over the next 20 years. Now, can wind and solar deliver those types of carbon reductions? Absolutely not. And because of that, we think that the various agency reports are all bound to disappoint. The press, investors, commentators, analysts don't really uh, comment much about is a concept that uh, both Adam and I think is, is extraordinarily important. It's a concept that, that uh, was put forward by the uh, Canadian economist Vaclav Smil in various books that he's talked about uh, regarding the, the, uh, the history of, of economic growth and the importance of energy consumption in that economic growth. And what, what Vaclav Smil was talking about and what we believe is so important is that it's the concept of energy in versus energy out. Obviously, when you think about, think about a standard hydrocarbon-based technology like uh, a, 
uh, a standard natural gas or coal-fired electricity generating plant. You, know, you, you burn hydrocarbons, you produce, you boil water, you produce steam, and you use that steam to turn turbines, which is then turned into electricity. The amount of energy that's required to produce either the coal or the natural gas, tr uh, transport it to the plant, build the plant, put the, the fuel into the plant, have it do what it does, that is combust, produce the steam. What you do is that basically you, uh, for every three units of energy that you expend doing what I just described, close to hundreds, hundred of units of energy come out. And when you think about it, that, that's, that's incredibly efficient. Now, just to show you how that compares with the wind and solar, it's vastly different and vastly inferior. For example, to build the solar panels, to install them, to, to hook them up with all the copper that's required, because you remember it requires a huge amount of copper to make these both wind farms and solar farms work. Build in the redundancy to improve your incredibly low load factors. And then to build the storage facilities to, to store the power, the electricity uh, that's produced. We're talking about literally uh, using uh, for 70 units of energy that's put into every one of that, what I've just described, only 100 units of, of, of energy come out the other side. So basically what you're, you're doing for, is it to produce uh, 100 units of energy, it requires 70 units to do, it, do that, or 70% of the energy produced. That's incredibly inefficient right there. And the amount of energy that that, that, that requires in itself is a, is a huge obstacle that in itself almost makes uh, the uh, ability to reduce uh, carbon emission from something like a solar farm almost impossible to obtain. Now with wind farms it's slightly better. You know, a, a huge offshore wind farm which has, uh, has slightly better uh, load factors but not that much. When you include the redundancy and the backup power you're talking about consuming almost 40 uh, units of energy for every 100 units of energy that comes out the other side. So again, it's, it's incredibly inefficient. The other issue with renewable power has to do with energy density. That is to say, how large do these installations have to be to generate a certain amount of power? And the truth of the matter is that hydrocarbon sources, whether you're talking about coal or oil or natural gas, they're very energy dense. There's a lot of energy stored per unit of volume and unit of mass. And as a result of that, uh, your, your energy densities are very, very high. Both the energy density issue and the intermittency issue come together in what we like refer to as this energy return on energy invested, or how much energy you have to put in the system to get energy back out of the system. And in the case of coal and natural gas, you're talking about 30 to 1. For every unit of energy you put into a coal ecosystem or a gas ecosystem, you get 30 units of usable energy in the form of electricity out the other side. In the case of natural gas, the amount of carbon emitted when you do all that is about half it is with coal. And that's why we've seen such adoption of natural gas in various economies where, where there has been ample supply because it's a very efficient way to reduce CO2 without reducing energy efficiency. Both wind and solar require an upfront investment in energy in order to manufacture the various windmills and solar farms. And in exchange, you are then hoping for a stream of carbon-free electricity over time. But remember, you've spent a lot of that carbon savings just building out the infrastructure in the first place. We estimate that it would take 10 years for a typical wind and solar farm to be able to recoup the carbon that's emitted in its manufacturing process. And considering the average life of a windmill is between 15 and 20 years, and a solar farm is about 20 years, although you see degradation in performance before that, you can see that a huge amount of the carbon savings actually gets spent uh, in creating um, the asset in the first place. And so remember, if you go back to those IEA and BP reports that assume that you can get your carbon intensity per unit of energy down 75, 90%, you simply can't do that uh, using wind and solar because you're gonna have to spend so much energy to get there in the first place because they're so energy inefficient. One of the more interesting, uh, and I, 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 I'll use the word crazes, that has emerged just in the last six months has been uh, 
the, what I call the hydrogen craze. When you truly incorporate the amount of energy that's required to produce hydrogen, energy in versus energy out, uh, statistics that I used before when I was talking about solar and wind are horrendous in the sense that you will never be able to overcome that phenomenon that hydrogen does not occur naturally in nature. It has to be manufactured and it requires a huge amount of energy. Uh, it's fairly simple to manufacture hydrogen. You take water and you take electricity uh, and you use the electricity and the energy in the electricity to break the bonds in the water molecules between the hydrogen and the oxygen. And what you're left with is a hydrogen gas and an oxygen gas. Unfortunately, to break bonds uh, of water molecules requires a tremendous amount of energy. You end up losing about 70% of all of the energy that gets put into the system into the in the first place. The question is whether electricity from wind and solar will be able to provide uh, that, that carbon reduction necessary to offset all of the lost energy in a hydrogen ecosystem. And the answer is unequivocally not. And so because of that, we think that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, will not be able to drastically reduce uh, CO2 emissions, uh, despite the fact that they can be powered by electricity and they don't require an expensive or energy intensive lithium ion battery, which has been the big uh, positive feature of hydrogen fuel cell to date. One of the, the solutions that both Adam and I are convinced is a is a true solution to this very, very complex problem is the use of generating electricity via nuclear power. You know, as I mentioned before, the energy efficiency, that is the amount of energy that goes into generating nuclear power versus the energy that comes out the other side is unparalleled. It's unbelievably efficient. Plus the fact that in the fission, the fission reaction itself, no CO2 is released. Here we are, decades after nuclear power was first introduced as a, as a usable source of electricity, and global nuclear energy makes up less than uh, less than 10 percent. I think it's close to 5 percent of primary energy demand around the world. That's incredible when you really think about it. Here we have a technology. Even before we were concerned with carbon in the atmosphere, you had a technology that had dramatically superior energy return on energy invested to what it was trying to replace, namely coal and gas. It was able to be used as baseload power, it could be scaled, uh, and yet it's never been able to uh, exceed 10% of, of primary energy demand, and today it's closer to 5%. Um, that, that's what led several people, including Backlab Smilt, to call it the most successful failure of all time. It worked in every capacity except for public adoption, and the reasons for that has to do with the perception of safety. The truth of the matter is that, that nuclear energy is extremely safe um, and was the only source of power today that can adequately address the dual issues of carbon, baseload power, and energy return on energy invested. Nuclear power is one of the only solutions that based upon our research really has the ability to accomplish those goals.